This video is made possible by The Great Courses Plus, an on-demand video learning service. To learn at your own pace with no tests or schedules, check out a free trial from The Great Courses through the link in the description below. More about them in a bit. All but two of America's presidents have exercised the power granted to them in Article 2 of the Constitution of the United States to pardon individuals for various federal crimes. William Henry Harrison and James Garfield are the exceptions. Both died during short terms in office. Beginning with George Washington and continuing through the administration of Benjamin Harrison, the president wrote out the pardon by hand addressing it to the recipient. Washington pardoned 16 people during his two terms in office, including two for the crime of treason for participating in the Whiskey Rebellion. Before and since his use of the pardon, the ability has been challenged by Congress, by public sentiment, and in the courts, though no president has ever had a pardon overturned. Several have been highly controversial, such as Jimmy Carter's blanket pardon of draft evaders, though Truman pardoned draft evaders after World War II, and Gerald Ford's pardon of his predecessor Richard Nixon. In the 21st century, the president's every action is highly scrutinized and dissected by the 24-hour news cycle, but prior to the late 1960s, most presidential pardons went mostly unnoticed by the general public. Here are 10 examples of presidential pardons from American history which generated considerable discussion in Congress and the press. Number 10. James Madison pardoned the Pirate Brothers, Jean and Pierre Lafitte. In February 1815, President Madison granted pardons to Jean and Pierre Lafitte for their crimes of smuggling and piracy prior to and during the War of 1812. The brothers, both of whom it is believed had been born in France, aided the Americans under Andrew Jackson during the New Orleans campaign. During the preliminary phases of the fighting around New Orleans, the brothers' pirate base at Barataria was destroyed by American gunboats and troops. The pirates under Lafitte also received presidential clemency. The Lafitte brothers received their pardons with grace and then went right back to piracy. The brothers also operated as Spanish spies during the Mexican Revolution, continued to smuggle goods and slaves into New Orleans and other Gulf ports, and Jean preyed on ships of several nations. He claimed to be a valid privateer licensed by an unknown country, but his indiscriminate attacks on shipping indicate that he was just a pirate. Madison's pardon covered crimes committed prior to February 1815, not those which followed, and in 1821, the US Navy forced Jean to abandon Gal Galveston, which was then in Mexico. He died, likely in combat with a Spanish ship or ships in 1823. It is believed that Pierre died in 1821, probably in the Yucatan Peninsula, while spying for Spain. Number 9. Andrew Jackson had a pardon rejected by its intended recipient. In 1829, George Wilson and James Porter were charged with six counts of robbery of the U.S. mail and endangering the life of the mail carrier. They were tried, convicted, and sentenced to death by hanging scheduled for July the 2nd. On that date, James Porter went to meet his maker. George Wilson did not. Influential friends lobbied the president, Andrew Jackson, to pardon him. Jackson did so, and his death sentence was reduced to one of 20 years' imprisonment for one of the lesser charges. Wilson refused to accept the pardon. The refusal generated a debate over the president's power to issue pardons, and the dispute reached the Supreme Court. The court decided in favor of Wilson, reasoning that a pardon was similar to a deed and needed to be delivered and accepted in order to be valid. It is a grant to him. It is his property, and he may accept it or not as he pleases. Jesus, the court ruled. Chief Justice John Marshall wrote, We have no power in a court to force it on him. After refusing the president's clemency and prevailing in the Supreme Court, Wilson was hanged for his crimes. Number 8. John C. Fremont received a pardon after conviction by court martial. John C. Fremont, known as the pathfinder for his expeditions in the American West, served in California during the Mexican War and took control of the territory from the short lived California Republic in 1846. Confused and conflicting orders from the military bureaucracy, in Washington created two governors in California, Fremont and Stephen W. Kearney. Both had orders assigned to them as military governors, though with conflicting dates, and Kearney was superior in rank to Fremont. When Fremont disobeyed orders to submit to Kearney, the latter had him charged with mutiny and insubordination. The court-martial convicted Fremont, stripped him of his rank, and dishonorably discharged him. The court convicted him of disobeying orders and insubordination, though not of mutiny. President James K. Polk approved of the court's finding, but pardoned Fremont anyway, citing his early services to his country. The powerful Senator Thomas Hart Benson, Freeman's father-in-law, helped sway Polk's decision. Freeman was reinstated and restored to rank. Nonetheless, he resigned his commission as a point of honor. In 1856, Freeman, after previously serving as a senator from California, became the first candidate for president ever nominated by the Republican Party. He lost the election to James Buchanan after a particularly nasty campaign on both sides. Number 7. Brigham Young received a pardon for his role in the Utah War. Brigham Young received his appointment as territorial governor of the Utah 
territory from President Millard Fillmore. In practice, members of the Church of Latter-day Saints dominated the legislature and courts in the territory. Church leaders encouraged the use of ecclesiastical measures rather than civil procedures to resolve disputes. Stories in Eastern newspapers sensationalized many of their practices, raising the vision of a semi-monarchic state where polygamy and religious practices replaced democratic freedoms. Attacks on settlers bound for California and Oregon also raised concerns in the East. During the election campaign of 1856, the Utah problem was exaggerated in the press with James Buchanan and his party determined to restore order. As President Buchanan dispatched the U.S. Army to Utah, ostensibly to protect settlers and ensure the rights of non-Mormons were honored. Brigham Young sent a Mormon army to harass the troops, though there were no armed conflicts between Mormons and the army. Several civilians were killed, mostly transiting settlers. Young and his militia kept the U.S. Army under supply through the winter of 1857-58 by raiding cattle and supply wagons. In 1858, Brigham Young agreed to relinquish his seat as governor of the territory, and later that year, Buchanan issued a pardon for his role leading the resistance to federal authority. Number 6. Andrew Johnson pardoned all of the Confederacy, as well as some who conspired to kill Abraham Lincoln. Both Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Johnson offered clemency to some, though not all, members of the Confederacy after the recipient took an oath of loyalty to the United States. On Christmas Day 1868, Johnson rescinded the previous requirement for an oath and issued a blanket pardon to all who had served the Confederacy in any manner. His pardon included former Confederate President Jefferson Davis and Vice President Alexander Stevens. The pardons caused considerable political backlash among those who wished to punish the Confederacy for their sins. Johnson also pardons three men who had been convicted in the plot to kill Abraham Lincoln, led by John Wilkes Booth. Dr. Samuel Mudd, who set Booth's broken leg and then failed to notify authorities of the assassin's whereabouts, received a pardon. So did Edmund Spangler, whose role in the plot was holding Booth's horse when the actor entered Ford's theater. Johnson also pardoned Samuel Arnold. Arnold had participated in the earlier failed plot to kidnap Lincoln, but was in Old Point Comfort, Virginia, on the night of the president's murder. The court which convicted him reasoned that he had been positioned in Virginia to aid in Booth's escape. With the pardons, all three were released from federal custody. Now, just before we get into the rest of today's video, I do want to quickly mention today's fantastic sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. Look, I enjoy learning new things. It's a big part of the reason I started hosting YouTube channels where we learn new things. And it's also why The Great Courses Plus is such a natural sponsorship partner for this channel. It's a legitimate university education, but it's much more affordable. It's at your own pace, and there's no annoying homework or term papers. Let's say you're interested in a topic we deal with a lot on this channel, history. Well, you can hop onto The Great Courses Plus and learn from some of the world's best history professors. If you're enjoying this video in particular, for instance, you might want to check out a very relevant course, Investigating American Presidents, which is a course that looks at exactly what happens when a president is accused of abusing their power. And one of the best things about The Great Courses Plus is how accessible it is. You can watch it on a whole bunch of devices, phone, laptop, desktop, computer, wherever you like. They've also got audio streaming, which is super convenient so you can listen and learn on the move. There are also more than 11,000 lectures to choose from. Right now, you guys can check out an absolutely free trial with The Great Courses Plus by clicking on the link below or going to thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash top tens. Supporting our advertisers does help support the show, so if this seems like the extra bit of lifelong learning you're looking for, do go check them out. There is a link below. And let's get into the rest of today's video. Number five, Grover Cleveland's pardons the first convicted polygamist of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Rodger Clawson was the first American to be tried and convicted of polygamy under the Edmonds Act, enacted during the presidency of Chester Arthur. The statute survived several legal challenges, including that it invalidated marriages which had previously been legal. Clawson was prosecuted under the Act in 1882. During his trial, the judge locked up one of his wives for refusing to testify against the accused. When Clawson was convicted, the judge handed down the maximum sentence defined under the law, 42 months imprisonment, and a fine of $1,500 almost $40,000 today. Clawson appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, which heard his case and upheld his conviction. In 1887, Grover Cleveland pardoned Clawson, who by then had served all but a few months of his sentence. In 1893, Cleveland's successor, Benjamin Harrison, extended a blanket amnesty to all members of the Church of Latter-day Saints who had engaged in bigamy or polygamy. The pardons included more than 1,300 men convicted under the Act. No women were convicted under the Edmonds Act, as prosecutors generally regarded them as victims of predatory behavior. Some, however, went to jail for contempt when they refused to testify in court. Number four, Calvin Coolidge pardoned a German World War I saboteur and spy. Lothar Witzke, a German naval officer, escaped internment at Valparaiso, Chile in 1916 and traveled under an assumed name in the guise of a common seaman to San Francisco. There he contacted the German consul Franz von Bopp. Recruited into espionage activities in the then neutral United States, Witzke expanded his activities to include sabotage. He participated, according to his own remarks,
remarks, as well as other evidence, in the infamous Black Tom explosion, one of the largest non-nuclear explosions of all time. It destroyed over $20 million worth of ammunition and TNT waiting to be shipped to Europe and killed at least four American citizens. Whitzker was arrested by American authorities in February 1918. With the US then at war, he was tried as a spy, convicted by a military court, and sentenced to death. Before the sentence could be carried out, though, the armistice was signed and the German sentence was commuted to life in prison by Woodrow Wilson in 1920. In 1923, with Whitzker in custody at the federal prison at Leavenworth, Germany's ambassador to the United States lobbied President Coolidge for his release. Coolidge pardoned the spy in 1923 and deported him to Germany. He received the Iron Cross upon his return to Germany and served in the Abwehr under William Canaris during the Second World War. Number three, Franklin D. Roosevelt issued over 3,600 pardons during his 12 years in office. FDR exercised the power of pardon with considerable gusto during his administrations. Several went to bootleggers convicted under the Volstead Act once prohibition ended in 1933. Among the many pardoned was Roy Olmsted, a former Seattle cop who became one of the Northwest's most successful bootleggers. Like many bootleggers, his activities were well known to local authorities, though bribes and blackmail kept him out of the hands of the law. With few willing to testify against him, federal agents applied the relatively new technique of using wiretaps to his phones. The evidence led to his and 21 others' indictments and convictions. He was sentenced to four years' imprisonment. Olmsted stayed out of jail while his appeals, based on the argument that wiretaps amounted to self-incrimination in violation of his Fifth Amendment rights, worked through the courts. The Supreme Court disagreed in a landmark decision in 1928. Olmsted served his sentence. In 1935, on Christmas Day, FDR pardoned the former bootlegger, which had the effect of eliminating a tax debt of over $100,000 that the IRS claimed he owed in unpaid taxes on illegal liquor sales. The Supreme Court decision legitimizing wiretaps applied without judicial authority was overturned by another Supreme Court decision, Katz and the United States, in 1967. Number two, Gerald Ford pardons the former Tokyo Rose. Either Taguri D'Aquino, an American citizen, became famous as Tokyo Rose, a name applied to her radio broadcasts by American military in the Pacific Theater. She identified herself on air as Orphan Anne. Born in Los Angeles, she visited Japan in the summer of 1941 and was there when the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred later that year. According to her many apologists, she was pressured into participating in the broadcasts, and once the war ended and Japan was under military occupation, she was held only briefly by U.S. authorities. The FBI and General MacArthur's staff did not find any evidence that she had aided the Japanese war effort. She was released and returned to the United States. Once back in America, pressure to convict her grew in radio broadcasts, the press, and the emerging industry of television. Walter Winchell, a powerful influence in American society, led the charge against her. She was arrested, charged with treason, and tried on eight specific counts. Convicted of just one, she was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. She was the only American citizen convicted of treason as a result of activities during World War II. Paroled after serving six years, she lived quietly the rest of her life. President Gerald Ford pardoned her in 1977 on his last full day in office, after evidence emerged that several witnesses at her trial perjured themselves against her. Number 1. Ronald Reagan pardons the man who was deep throat during the Watergate investigation. During the Washington Post's investigation into the complexities of the crimes known as Watergate to posterity, Bob Woodward relied on a confidential informant that he called Deep Throat. Deep Throat's true identity wasn't formally revealed until 2005 when Mark Felt, associate director of the FBI at the time of the investigation, admitted he was the informant. Many people involved, including Nixon, suspected Felt, but he had several times denied it over the years. During the 1970s, Felt directed numerous illegal searches and break-ins during investigations into the weather underground. When the extent of the FBI's illegal activities came to light during congressional investigations, Felt was charged with conspiracy to violate the rights of American citizens. Felt publicly admitted ordering numerous illegal searches and break-ins, and in November of 1980, he was convicted at trial. The conviction occurred two days after the 1980 presidential election, which elevated Reagan to the presidency. Ironically, several of the men brought down by Felt's contributions to the Watergate investigation, which began over an illegal break-in, testified on Felt's behalf. Among them was Richard Nixon. Felt appealed his conviction, which included a $5,000 fine. He faced a potential 10-year sentence in prison, but the the judge ordered no time served. Before the appeal was heard, Ronald Reagan pardoned Felt on March 26, 1980, though it wasn't made public until April. When it was, Nixon sent Felt a congratulatory bottle of champagne. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.